loud enough and fast enough you won't be able to hear all the stuff in the background maybe you know what this movie made me want to watch what that we talked about for our podcast like actually like a year ago at this point what return of the killer tomatoes oh that's a great movie remember when we told everyone that we were going to uh (laughs) watch all of the killer tomato movies with bailey and then we didn't yeah we should do that we should real. definitely do that for real right after we do all the other stuff with <laughs> Bailey for real. But for real, we should do Return of the Killer Tomatoes. Oh, yeah. That's a phenomenal movie. I feel like horror comedies more often than not are mistaken for like bad movies than actually being bad. Yeah, because Return of Killer Tomatoes was not supposed to be a bad movie. No. And in many ways, it's not but in many ways it is similar to this week's episode do you like how i did that transition i do welcome to bad movie date night the podcast where we attempt to take bad movies seriously treat them as they should be treated and uh, we believe inside every bad film is an overlooked piece of art waiting to be revealed to the world i'm nigel from a journey into film.com and with me is caitlin my wife hello and this week we're talking about the 1987 film return to horror high directed by bill froelich written by bill froelich mark leeson dana escalante i'm definitely sure i mispronounced mark's last name but we're gonna keep going (laughs) this movie is notable for being the first feature length movie debut of George Clooney. And they underutilized him. They really do. He lasts maybe 15 minutes. Maybe. He is the first death of the movie, spoiler alert. And he doesn't even come back. And you think like you that's actually true. In light of the ending, he does not come back. Yeah, which is confusing. Well, no, I could think of a reason why. Why? Well, we'll talk about it. I just do want to say right now, this ending, the ending of this movie is really great if you don't know what's going on. So if you don't want us to spoil it for you, because it is a major part of what we'll be talking about, then you should turn this off right now. And watch this movie. And, and watch this movie. play our podcast again. It's available on Prime. And you know what? Because this is a recording, it's not going anywhere. You can pause it and you can come back to it at any time. I have a question, though, that I'm dying to ask because okay. you confused me at the beginning. Was this supposed to be a not good movie? No, this was supposed okay. to be a horror comedy. Oh, it was supposed to be a horror comedy. Yes. Okay. Well, OK, here's the here's the thing. I think in many ways it was, which would explain like Almost all of the Marsha Brady scenes. Yes. Because I feel like that was was the primary source of comedy in this. Yeah. Which then draws into question whether or not it's a comedy or not. (laughs) But I also wonder, and I would be very curious to know, like, when did horror comedies start to become a thing? Because... In many ways, I do wonder if we retroactively are calling some of these bad movies horror comedies to try to be like, yeah, we knew it wasn't good. Kind of like what they did with Chopping Mall. Right. I I think that you should research that and find out and then tell me. (laughs) I should. Because I, I, I mean, maybe they were trying to make a horror comedy with this movie, but I don't think there's a lot of funny scenes in it. 
there was not a lot of raffle moments. If you will. If you will. Uh, roll on the floor laughing for those who don't use text abbreviations. <laughs> uh, it, it, well, okay. So here's the thing that I found interesting about this movie. It basically, as far as I could find, predates like all of the meta horror that is super popular now. Okay. This came out in 1987. Okay. So this is like smack dab in the height of 80s horror. You said Chopping Mall also came out this year? Or no? Actually, that's a good point. I should look up what movies came out in 1987. Because that would be a good way to gauge what else is popular at this time. All right, we got, ooh, we have a lot of really good movies that came out this year. We have The Lost Boys, Prince of Darkness, Hellraiser, Predator, Monster Squad, The Witches of Eastwick, Nightmare on Elm Street 3, Evil Dead 2, um, The Gate. That was a weird movie. We should talk about that one on here. Uh, Dolls, which we talked about on here <laughs> already. Um, Terror at the Opera, which is uh, Dario Argento's fantastic movie. And, uh, you know, so those are, those are the big ones, just to give you an idea of, like, what was... What was popular at this time? Oh, The Video Dead came out this year, too, which oh. is our next episode. Interesting. Yes. Uh, also, Teen Wolf 2. <laughs> Not T-W-O, but T-O-O. Oh, wow. I would like to know when that became... Like, what was Always. the first movie to do... To use, like, 2 as an also instead of, like, number 2 for the title of a sequel... They thought they were so clever. Right. Well, the first time it was clever, but then after <laughs> that it became, haha, <laughs> like, too fast, too furious. Right. Or back to school. Yeah. Well, back to school it With would the number not be, two. Yeah, but it, like, wouldn't, I'm talking about uses of, like, T-O-O. Oh, I was just talking about stupid uses of two. Because <laughs> <laughs> it should be back. T-O, school. Correct, yes. But they did it back. The number two, school. Yeah. Dumb. So it's back in two schools. <laughs> right. It doesn't even make <laughs> two sense. Two schools are back. <laughs> uh, okay. So along with George Clooney, there's also a very strange, not really a cameo because it's a pretty regular part of the movie, but Marsha Brady is in this. Yeah. Maureen McCormick. And she has... An interesting role. She has a very interesting role. So the premise of this movie, just to, let's lay some groundwork real quick. It also should note, this has no relation to the 1973 movie Horror High. Uh, it just, if you think it's a sequel, it's not. It's <laughs> a sequel to the events that take place in the movie. So basically, 1982, there's this high school, Crippen High School. And there was a series of murders there, but the killer was never caught. Ooh. Spooky. Spooky. We should have like a sound effect whenever you say the word <laughs> spooky, since we, we talked it. That would be fun. Right. Like, what's a cool sound effect from spookies that we can use whenever we say spooky? The farting sound. <laughs> the farting <laughs> sound. Spooky. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay. So, that's what happened. They never caught the killer. So, spooky. There is a movie that is filming at this high school, and they are making a movie about the murders. Now, when the movie starts, we are outside of the school, and there are body parts everywhere. And... Police are on the scene. Police are on the scene. Marsha Brady is one of the, the police. Mm -hmm. I don't even remember her name. I don't either. I don't remember the other police officer that no. was with her. Um, and they're trying to piece together what happened. 
And piece together the body parts. And the body wow. parts. I should have prepared for that better. <laughs> Uh, the only person who's alive appears to be the writer of the script, which is important. And what then transpires throughout the rest of the movie is a back and forth between filming scenes, the actors hanging out at the school, and then cutting back to the aftermath of everything. So you know where everything is going, you just got to piece together the bits that get you there. Yes. And to lead into our first question, I thought that this was something that was really well done with the movie. Because up until the very end, I did not know who the killer was going to be. Oh, yeah. I think they did a great job with that. <laughs> and I think they did a, um, I think their little twist at the end there. I mean, was it like amazing to win academy awards no but i thought it was fun and clever and i had a good laugh at it yes there were parts of the ending that i liked yeah and then as the ending continued to end yeah okay i would say like the actual (laughs) ending of the movie because then the rest i just got like this is over the top when you say the actual ending when they drive off and when okay 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 So not anything that happens after that. No, not the like 10 minutes that follows the actual ending of the movie. Yeah, this is one of those movies that... It doesn't know when to stop. It does not know when to stop. And so I I would say that is a positive and a negative about that. Yeah. But we'll talk more about that in a little bit. I also thought that the meta commentary was very strong. Yes, it was. Because in many ways... This movie attempted to do kind of what Scream did before Scream did it. One of the actresses, she has issues with nudity and the producer is constantly telling her that they need... Well, so the the producer of the movie, played by Alex Rocco, uh, Harry... What was his last name? Slyric. Which, this guy, you think he's going to die very quickly into the movie, but he does not. And that was kind of disappointing. I mean, I guess he did a good job, because I hated him the whole time. <laughs> do we ever see him die? Like, I know he dies, but do we ever actually see it? I don't think we do. I don't remember how he dies. Actually, you know it was a very funny scene that didn't include Marsha Brady? What? When they were filming the scene in the bathroom and, like, 50 people come out of the stall. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) That was pretty funny. That was good, too. There's just an endless train of people coming out. Like, they had to film something in the stall (laughs) and you see an endless crew of people come out. Uh, I will say something that did was disappointing is it was never really clear how many people were working on the movie. And so when they kept bringing up how more and more people were disappearing, you didn't really have any frame of reference for if how concerning that was or right. not. Now, like the, when they keep interviewing the, the writer and he would say things like, I forget exactly what he said, like something like at one point we had one actress playing four different roles in the movie. And then you kind of understand why the main actress is like, uh, switching wigs and stuff all yeah. the time. Like, it explains that, but there's really not enough to contextualize how many people are dying off. Right. And now that I think about that, that also raises some red flags with the <laughs> twist ending, but we'll get there in a second. So anyways, the the main actress, played by Lori Lethen, Callie Cassidy... Callie Cassidy is her character name. She's She addresses this sketchy producer by saying, I don't want to do any nudity and stuff. And at one point, like, she's doing a sex scene, and all of a sudden you see, like, a hand creep up from, like, underneath the car and, like, start groping her and, like, trying to pull her bra off and <laughs> stuff. And it's just, I don't know. 
and she throws a fit about it. Did you feel like the flashbacks were kind of like weird? They weren't real flashbacks, I guess, but some yeah. of them like were question mark. None of no? the movie actually happened. Now that I think about it, but right. you're but like, did they? I know the flashbacks parts were I was they confused me honestly. Yeah. I guess we can try to figure that out here in a minute. <laughs> but then also the director, he comes from a documentary background. Mm-hmm. Not the director of Return to Horror High, the director in the movie, making the movie. <laughs> he comes from a documentary background, and so he wants to like make this artful movie about people and their emotions and kind of like a character study of like what people do during a serial killer situation. Mm -hmm. But again, Harry Slyric, the producer, he's like, no, we need more blood. We need more guts. and nudity cells. Right. And that's his whole thing Mm -hmm. is he wants this big exploitation blockbuster type thing. And the scriptwriter is stressing out because he has to rewrite a scene like every day. Um, yeah. So that in the, it's, I guess that's really like the extent of like the meta ness of it because it's also kind of undone. Well- Yes, I just want to mention that the people who actually the murders act like were there when the murders took place came back and like reprised their role live. Yes, that's important. So the principal who was the principal of the school during the murders came back to be the principal in the movie and the janitor which is also a confusing thing. Yeah. came back to be the janitor and in the, the police movie. officer. And the, well, yeah, well, one of the police student. officers. So after, we're doing a really good job of being, like, consistent with this plot and, like, talking about <laughs> Well, things. this plot kind of jumps all over the place. Yeah. So the, because George Clooney dies quickly and he's playing the main police officer role, they ask the police officer who was part of the, who was there during the murders as a to, student, as a student to stand in for, well, to basically play himself in right. the movie. And they're like, yeah, it'll be raw and real because now we have these real people mm-hmm. interacting in these fake situations. And it's the, the other thing that I thought they did very well was, filming showing them filming scenes for the movie and just kind of being in the scene and not showing them filming the scene until the scene stopped being filmed does that make sense how i worded that yeah there were a couple moments when you think oh is this a flashback right oh no it's just them making the movie Mm -hmm. and that was kind of a cool way to add more layers to to this already layer filled movie yeah Arguably, there comes a point when a movie has too many layers. Right. And I would say that Return to Horror High, perhaps in one of the negatives, suffered from too many layers. Yes. Yes. Way too many. (laughs) Yeah. So, but you know what? In the end, I think it really comes together. Which end? No. You know, the end. Um... Look, they got a picture of Marsha Brady being all... But it ex- was such a weird scene. Yeah. All right. So, did you think that there were any... So, let's step away from talking about the story for a second. All right. Because I, I kind of want to just talk about the ending as a whole at on its own. Yeah. But let's just kind of talk... Did you Was there... What else did you think was done really well about it like did i thought that george clooney was definitely a missed opportunity yeah, not having him that. in more of the movie mm-hmm. um and 
I don't really know what decisions Marsha Brady was making. <laughs> I don't know what was happening with that. That was weird. Yes. At one point, it seems like there's a lot of sexual tension between Marsha Brady and her police chief. Which was weird. Yes. And at one point, she has blood all over her and she seems to be aroused by it. And she has like five buttons undone. Yes. But then in the next scene, she's eating a chili dog and dropping bits of chili on the chief. It was so weird. Like, what? why? Why do they do that? I don't know. Like, then, what direction do they give her for her character, for her to act like that? I don't know. I would love to see what her role was like in the actual screenplay. Right? Because it didn't make any sense. No. It was, and I was like, why are you adding this right. into the movie? Why does she, like, why can't we just have a normal conversation between two police officers right. about all of these body pieces that are lying around? Yeah. So I, re- I want to figure that out. If anyone knows, let me know what on earth was going on with Marsha Brady in this movie. She also got really excited about finding, was it an arm or a foot at one point? I think an arm, I think. Yeah. Like, they, like, the police get there and there's literally body parts everywhere and they don't know how to put the pieces when or where. Right. And even up until the very end, they're just, you know, putting pieces together. Mm -hmm. You would think that the police officers would just like bag them on, take them to the morgue or something. Right. Like what is actual protocol for, for a scene in which there are no bodies or no bodies intact? I think you just bag it up. Just bag it up. And, like, put it together at the morgue. It's like the middle of the night. They can't even see what they're doing to begin with. Yeah. But I also have a lot of questions now about the ending because of that. Uh, like what? Well, well, we'll get there in a second. Okay. Or a couple of minutes. I don't know. <laughs> Comparative to... Or compared to other horror movies, I thought that the kills in this were very unoriginal. Yeah. Except for the one where they cut open the teacher's chest. Yeah, that was disturbing. There's a very... There's an extended sequence in which one of the teachers who came back, or the principal... No, I was he an actor? He had to have been... I think he was, he an, was actor. an actor. Yeah. But basically, there's an extended scene in which the killer murders the teacher and basically... Dissects him. Basically dissects him because the teacher was bullying this kid who didn't want to dissect a frog. But in the movie, not in real life. But like in in the movie within a movie, it wasn't an actual killing. No, he did. He... Did he die? I thought he died. Oh no, this movie is causing more questions than we're giving answers. I don't think, I think it was just a scene that they filmed. No, I think he died. I I mean, I get, well. Because who killed him? It didn't like cut to. Well, that was the thing is I thought that, well, I thought... Yeah, I don't... Maybe he did die. I don't know. Maybe he didn't. I I don't know. Yeah. And the other thing is, like, there's no... There's never any consistent face of the killer. No. You never really see what they're doing. And so many people do die, either in real life or in the movie, that you do begin to start to lose track. Yeah. It does start to get a little iffy towards the end as to whether or not someone actually died or if it was a movie death. Mm -hmm. You know what I just remembered? What? That makeup guy with the weird haircut. Yeah. This guy is like a... That was a choice he made. He had like... It was like a mullet. 
Kind of. But the front, his bangs were cut straight across his forehead on the front. Like too high. Like way too high. His hair, like he had very sharp hairlines. But then he had these two really long strands over his ear. Like rat tails. But yeah, like, like ear tails. Yeah, ear rat tails. <laughs> Is that a thing? Horrible. I don't know. But it was horrible. And I don't know why they let him be in that movie with that haircut. I don't. Someone said, hey, this is a thing that you want to do. Except, like, this is the end of the 80s, too, buddy. So I don't know what on earth you were thinking. Right? It was a bold choice he made, and it was disgusting. Yes, it was a very, very bold choice. And I wish that I could find, like, a picture of it so I could do a better job of accurately... Yeah, you can make that our thumbnail. I should make that our (laughs) thumbnail. All right, let's go to this. Uh, What aspects contributed to an aesthetic experience, Caitlin? Did you like this movie? (laughs) Um, Yeah, I did like it. I did like it. I I thought it was fun. I feel like I would rewatch it. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun watching it. I thought that... The story was, like, engaging enough, though it did leave me with a lot of questions. It was engaging enough that I, like, I enjoyed, like, paying attention to it. But I also thought that it was, like, strange enough that it didn't become boring. And I think that's what made it fun for me, was the strange parts. I thought that the ending, because of how out of left field it felt Mm -hmm. like within the context of everything definitely contributes to my desire to rewatch this movie. Yeah. Especially because I have so many questions. Right. About it. I'm wondering if a second viewing will give me more answers. I don't think it will. I don't anticipate more answers from more rewatches of this. I would agree, but I'm going to try to like pay attention to more things. Yeah. Like it, it honestly seems like they were filming this movie and then they're like, you know what? This is how it's going to end. Mm-hmm. And, uh... Or, no, I feel like they couldn't decide on an ending. Yeah, that's also true. So, should we consider this movie to be good? I mean... I feel like it was uh, different. Yeah. And I think that makes it good. Because it was creative enough that it didn't feel formulaic. Yeah. But it was also, like, the acting's not bad. No, it's not. I think the acting is, I think they're good actors. I, I think everyone did a good job. I definitely think this movie at least flew under the radar. Yeah. It's Or not under the radar, but it's at least underrated. Yeah. Enough that I feel like it deserves more credit and it deserves more people watching it. Yeah, I would agree. I think acting was good. I think the effects were good. Yeah. It wasn't formulaic and I thought overall they did a nice job with it. Yeah. The few times that we they had some good kills, yeah. the effects were pretty well done. The few times I knew what was going on, they did a good job. Yeah. <laughs> I do think, like, it would be, like, a totally different movie today if they had put George Clooney as their main guy. Like, if they filmed the exact same movie? Yeah. But, like, George Clooney was the police officer? Yeah. Instead of the replacement police officer? hmm Yeah, that'd be weird. I would love to... I feel like this movie is ripe for today because being meta is the cool thing to do right now. Mm-hmm. And people would love this movie because it's kind of meta about the horror genre. Yeah. Not in like an over over the top, like wink, wink, nudge, nudge way, like Cabin in the Woods. Mm -hmm. But just like, hey, we have some stuff to say about exploitation and horror movies. And we are going to be a little on the nose and explicit about it. Then technically they do kind of undo it all at the end. I know. The ending... I would love to know what went on during talks on how to end the movie. 
Yeah. Let's talk about the ending. Let's just get into it. Okay. Okay. So our the protagonist of the movie, since we didn't really talk about that, it's uh it's the actress Callie Cassidy and the police officer Stephen Blake. Mm-hmm. Now they they start up a bit of a romance of sorts. Right, as on you this. do. Yes. And it should be noted that Steve's Steven's girlfriend from high school, Kathy, disappeared. I thought she died. No. No, she disappeared. She dis- that's right. That's because right. Because she went to grandma's and never came back. Yeah. Yeah. They had sex for the first time. On prom night. On prom night. And then she disappeared. Mm-hmm. And her dad, the who's the principal, who was the principal and is acting in the movie said that she went to graduate school. And Steve's like, cool. So, pretty much like the last night that they're there, Josh, or why did that come out? <laughs> Who's Josh? Uh, Steve and Callie basically find like a trail of blood mm-hmm. and they follow it all the way to the sand pit. Like a shot put, not shot put, long jump track sand pit thing. I don't really know what they use the sand pit for, but I just know it's for track. But also, that room had like a propeller. Yeah, I thought it was a wood shop, babe. A wood shop room. It looked more like a wood shop room, but why would they have that in there? I don't know. There's a secret trap door underneath the sandbox i don't remember how they find it but they both descend into some tunnels underneath the school and they come across Which is like super creepy if you have tunnels under your school yeah what you know school has tunny tunnels under i mean i guess maybe if you're like an old school with like a boiler room in the basement yeah that's creepy i don't know if our school any school i went to had a basement my school did my ghetto school and I went down there, but it was just like, we didn't have tunnels. At least they didn't show me the tunnels when we were down there. Yeah. It was our, my classroom's tornado drill spot. Okay. Yeah, I never went into a basement for a tornado <laughs> drill, so I'm going to assume that we did not have a basement. Probably safe assumption. It's probably better to not have a basement. It's probably definitely better. To, it was not a pleasant basement. If I've learned anything from horror movies... Don't have a basement in your school. Yeah. Because that is where bad things happen. Or in your house. Do you know how happy I am that we don't really have a basement? Like a true basement? Because... Yeah. mm -mm, It's spooky. Yeah. I wonder what started with basements, like, becoming known for being spooky. Yeah, I don't know. Where do our fears come from? Why now, that's do our fears come from? we need to talk about on this podcast. We should talk about where our fears come from. That would be fascinating. So, okay. We are way off track. Way off tra- track. I can talk good today. <laughs> they find a classroom full of dead bodies, full of skeletons. And they're like, what is this? And... They're freaking out, and the janitor, Amos, shows up, and he's like, oh, yeah, there's, like, this weird thing in here. <laughs> and basically, it's all of all of the kids who were murdered in 1982 are in this classroom. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, Amos attacks Steve, and you're like, oh, Amos, like, you were a cool guy. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, you were the token black guy in the movie. Right. Find out it's a mask. What? And the principal has been pretending to be the janitor. For For how long? For God knows how long. That is... Like, did he live his whole life as two people? Does that janitor have another family? That would be... No. What janitor has a family? You know, I think he lived a double life and he had two families. That would be wild, especially since there are parts of him that 
<laughs> that are, would not be black, and, and his I, children would not be. And his children would also color. not be black. So I'm gonna say that the family aspect probably <laughs> was not part of it. All right, it was a cool, cool thought. But I do apart. wonder why would he intentionally make his life harder right, by being, being the janitor people. and the principal. And the janitor doesn't really have much of a role or anything. No. Literally, the janitor's in like three scenes prior to he sh- him showing up at the end. And then unmasking himself as the principal. And you're thinking, wait a minute. Why? Like, did you, maybe that's why he went crazy trying to live two right. lives. It's stressful. This Was this like... You know, when the king dresses up like a poor person to go, like, (laughs) strut about the town. But double paycheck, though. Yeah. I mean, he could have just given himself more money, probably, (laughs) or, like, asked for a raise. But, you know, I'm sure he had his reasons for being the (laughs) janitor. To spy on his daughter more, maybe. Probably. So we find out that the principal killed all of these kids. And... We find out that Kathy was pregnant with Steve's child and killed her and then kept her in the basement. And she was the first. No, no, no. I don't think he killed her. Yeah, he did. Because that was her body down there. I know. I know. But I think she died. Like, on her own. Because he said she was pregnant and she tried to give herself an abortion. Yeah, but I think he killed her. I think he was mad. About, but he, the pregnancy he literally or the says abortion. she tried to give herself an abortion. I assume that she just died from that. Yeah, I thought he killed her because he was acting super weird with her skeleton. He tried to. He's he starts going on a thing about how he wants Steve to marry Kathy. Yeah, that was weird. Which is a skeleton. Let's just remind everyone <laughs> of that. Can you be married to a skeleton? Not legally. (laughs) I need to know, though, did he kill her or did she die by giving herself an abortion? So whoever knows the answer to that also hit me up. Yeah, maybe. I feel like this is going to be one of those moments where someone's sitting there like, those dumb people, did they even watch the movie? (laughs) We really should rewatch this movie. Yeah. So Steve kills the the principal with a javelin. And Steve and Callie, they run away. After, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they just leave. Mm -hmm. We never see them again. That's crazy. Because they're not in on the next part. Which doesn't make sense. Which does not make sense. Well, okay. Here's where things get weird. (laughs) You think, okay, that's that's a cool ending. You know, oh, it's the principal all along, you know. Mm -hmm. It's the equivalent of, like, the butler did it. Right. So then we cut outside to the police and the writer and the bodies and the apparently the writer knew about Steve and Callie in the basement because he's telling them what happened. Yeah, but yeah. Well, I guess we know why he knows, but we'll get there in a second. The. Police then run into the building to go check everything out and go find this hidden basement classroom. Mm -hmm. And as soon as they all go in, the writer says, all clear. And all the bodies get up. (laughs) And you find out that this was all an elaborate prank for marketing purposes. Right. And they gather up all of the actors and crew members. But not all of them. People are missing. George Clooney. George Clooney is missing from that. Callie and the... And Steve. Steve. Yeah, so, okay. Callie and Steve, I think they just left. They were like, oh, this is... He's like, everybody's dead. Let's just get out of here. Which I don't really... But they actually went through something that was not part of the movie that was bad. They should go to the police. Yeah, they should go to... Maybe they went to the police, and that's where the police showed up. But it also was a crazy random happenstance that they actually found the murder classroom... Right. I do not think that was part of the original plan. Yeah. Because all of the cast and crew dying was a big marketing stunt to sell the movie. Right. And George Clooney is also not there. But he was also offered an acting job 
at the beginning of the movie, mm-hmm. and he was trying to leave anyway. So that I think that's why he's not there. So like maybe he's on the acting job. Yeah, maybe he's like. But then why did they kill him? So that they could, I don't know. So that they could say that he died. That's okay. Or I don't know. They didn't know he died. They never. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> It was very unclear who died and who didn't yeah. die at the ending. So anyway, they clean up all the body parts, jump in a van, and leave. And, and you think that was kind of confusing, but okay. You're I, like, okay, I'm here for it. Right. And then we cut and to... And then it falls apart. Yeah. So the basement, the police find the principal, still with the javelin, but apparently he's alive. And tries to attack them, and they just kind of shoot him dead. And they are they go outside, and they're like, those bodies are gone. And they're like, all right, I guess there might still actually be a killer, question mark. And they drive off. And we'll talk about the guy in the makeup, the makeup guy. Yeah, so as the makeup guy's driving away... <laughs> He's like, what does he say? Like, oh, it'll be a prank this time. Yeah, but the like real thing will happen next time or something. Yeah, like that. the real murders will. Ha- I don't remember exactly. Basically, what he says. he's implying that he's gonna actually kill them. Yeah, the implications. <laughs> because of the implications. The impl- Yeah, because of the implications. You think he's an actual serial killer, right? And you're like, okay, that's a cool twist on top of a twist on top of a twist, right? But then, as if the movie has not had enough fun with you yet, (laughs) you find out that the writer is actually the son of the principal, Mm -hmm. and he's getting ready to write a new movie, The Return to Horror High, and as he's typing at his typewriter, blood starts dripping on it, and he turns around and looks behind him and he goes, Dad? And it cuts to black. That was insane. Right? So, if you ignore the ending Mm -hmm. after the principal dies, you think, okay, this is a straightforward movie about a principal killing people and a movie crew. Mm -hmm. And you think, this is a pretty good movie. Yeah. Pretty good. And then you find out it was all a marketing prank, all of the dead bodies, in air quotes, And you think, okay, I'm following along now. Mm -hmm. But again, why bother killing George Clooney? Right. Did they plan on... Did the principal actually kill George Clooney then? Maybe. I don't know. But it seems like he only killed women based on the bodies that were in the classroom. He didn't really specify who he killed, and they didn't really specify who was killed. No. No. But based on the bodies and the way they were dressed, you kind of assume that they were all women. hmm And, again, with the prank and everything, clearly they did not realize that the principal was the killer. And it, I, they didn't even find it, but the writer knew about it. Because the writer is the principal's son. Right. But then why would he be the one to tell them all clear? And also, how did they get the police there if they were all pretending to be dead? The writer called the police. Yeah, but then, like, what did Callie and Steve do? Why wouldn't they go to the police and tell them that they found a murder classroom? Yeah, I don't know. Wouldn't there be two groups of police there right. for different reasons? right. Um, yeah, so that's, uh, that, that's Return to Horror High. Whether our summary of the ending threw you <laughs> off from watching it or not, I hope not. And I hope that you saw it before we spoiled the ending, mm-hmm. because it really is completely bonkers. It is. To see it. It's, and it's not, like, so confusing that you completely can't follow. It's just, you start saying, what? Why? Okay. Yeah. It's an idea that on paper is more spectacular than it needs to be. Mm-hmm. But it's also not coherent enough 
to be great. Yeah. And that might be why this movie's been kind of underrated. I wonder what Marsha Brady and George Clooney have to say about being in this movie. Maureen McCormick. Yeah. I would love to hear their thoughts on it. Mm -hmm. George Clooney seems like the kind of guy that'd be like, yeah, I was in the stupid movie, but look how great it is. (laughs) (laughs) I'm great in this. (laughs) Just a little smug face and everything. (laughs) So, what else do we have to say about this movie? This movie, I think, overall is high on my rewatchability list. Oh, yeah. We'll definitely rewatch this. And this Mm -hmm. is definitely a movie that we will recommend to people forever until they watch it. Yeah. I've already recommended it to one person. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Which is a lot of people, because we don't know that many people. Yeah, we don't really know that many people, so it is a lot. Um, what else? Anything else that's good about this? No, I think it's a lot of fun. I think it's a good Friday night, date night movie. It is. It was a great date night movie. Um, there weren't really any relationship things in it to talk about. I mean, other than the girl who had the abortion and the Callie. Yeah. Well, to be fair, abortion girl, Kathy, should probably have not had a murderous father. Yeah. I feel like that really got in the (laughs) way of her. That's where the relationship went wrong. I really feel like she had, that was, you know, a big (laughs) roadblock between her and Steve having a happy relationship. A little bit, a little bit. Uh, and arguably she probably tried to have the abortion because of her father. Yeah. He probably going to kill her. She did. Yes. And then he did kill her anyway. And, um, Steve brought up Kathy a lot around Callie. Yeah. And Callie seemed completely okay with it. Yeah. I don't buy that their relationship's going to work. No, that was definitely like a, hey, we're working together, so let's Let's, bone type thing. Right. Let's solve a mystery and bone. Also, didn't I say this would be a good Scooby-Doo movie? This would be a great Scooby-Doo movie up until the prank murder (laughs) or the prank marketing stuff. Yeah, they should have made this just a Scooby-Doo film. This would have been a really good Scooby-Doo film. Mm -hmm. Like, almost perfect. Like, they should redo it. Like, I imagine the gang is there. Like, they're making a movie Mm -hmm. based on a mystery that the gang tried to solve, but they never did. Mm. But then people from the crew start dying, and they're given a second chance to solve the murder. And this time they do, and there's no marketing stunt. I like it. I think that's good. As long as they take that out, they can keep the little writer is the principal son twist. Yeah. It's literally just the whole this wasn't real, but it might have been real aspect that would not work. Yes. It doesn't work. It does not work. But it's great. But it doesn't work. (laughs) And that's all I have to say about that. They could have done better. (sighs) Yeah, Sometimes I feel like, did you, like, I want to ask these people, did you, did you put, like, an ounce of thought into this? Because <laughs> doesn't feel that way. Um, that's all I have to say about this. I think we can wrap this up. I think everyone should go watch this movie right now. Yes. Our next movie is going to be called The Video Dead. Kind of already referenced that. We watched it last night, and it is... It is something else. And we'll have a hard time saying nice things about it. (laughs) That being said, we still have not gotten our new definitive Bad Movie Day and Night ranking list together. We are working on that. We will have it soon. Well, right now we only have two movies anyway, so. Yeah. And for me it goes Spookies and then this one. (laughs) Yes, that's 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 a fair, fair assessment. As a reminder, we don't have social media anymore, so share a link to your friends or go to ajourneyintofilm.com and you can leave us some comments or some reviews. If you have any ideas for movies you want us to talk about, 
you know, let us know because every week it's like, hey, what can we watch? And, you know, we do a thing. Yeah. And uh, we will talk to you guys next time. See ya.